welcome um, again to the Elm City Vineyard. Um, as, as Josh said, my name is Matt Crosman. I'm the teaching pastor here. And um, a, a special welcome to you if this is one of, uh, your first time here or your first time here in a while. I know there are some folks I haven't seen for a while here, and it's, it's, glad, it's, it's great to see you. Um, we've been, uh, as Josh said, go, uh, teaching through a series on being church. What is it to be church? Um, church in, in the Bible isn't, isn't a place. There were no purpose-built church buildings um, back at the time when the, when the Bible was written. Church was a group of people. So church wasn't something you went to. It was something that you were. And this letter, this first letter that Paul wrote to this church that he had planted in Corinth is just full of practical wisdom and kind of big picture vision for what it is to be church, be the town council of God, as we've talked about it, this, the ecclesia, this group of people called together by God. And um, so we're, we're now um, more than halfway through already. We're, we're at um, up to chapter 10, and I'm just going to give you a kind of disclaimer at the beginning today. Um, it is my hope, of even today, no matter what, when we teach in ECV, that we don't just kind of hear what the Bible has to say and kind of learn it and understand it, but we get to hear it go deep um, in our own lives, and we get to see that kind of happen in our own world. And it's not just something out there, but it comes in something here. And I don't want to say that that's not going to happen today. <laughs> I want to say that, that, that there are also times when um, I, I feel like I get one of these talks and I feel like, oh, shoot, I think I'm mostly going to like explain big ideas. But I actually have great hope that big ideas actually give us the frameworks in which we can live and actually see our lives changed. So um, today there's a lot to talk about in these couple chapters. Some of them are kind of big picture ideas and we're going to hit on some of those. I, again, I, I don't want to give you the impression that we won't be talking about our lives in particular, um, but we're just, I'm just going to jump right in into chapters 10 and 11. Give us a bit of an overview of kind of what's in there and then we're going to go through at a pretty, pretty close level of detail and just kind of see what does God have to say to us about what it is to be church, who he's inviting us to become, how we are to relate to one another, right, and how, how we can live into this kind of, we, we've been calling for the last several weeks, this imaginative space, right, this, imagine, this space where we get to imagine together who, who, who it is that God's called us to be as we seek, walk forward as his people. So, um, in, in, in chapters 10 and 11, there, like I said, there is a lot here, um, and I just want to give us a framework so as we go through kind of dropping the needle here and there, you, you, you understand the larger structure. Um, if you have a Bible in, in the pew in front of you, you can, you can take a look at this. If We ran out of these booklets, unfortunately. I don't have any more booklets to pass out. Maybe you have that with you. You can take a look at this. But we're in chapter 10, and, and, and chapter 10 begins with a description. Um, Paul's kind of describing the Corinthians, describing this church in terms of the Hebrew Bible. He's actually reading the story of the people of God in his Bible and in, the, in his church's Bible. They didn't have the New Testament yet. They had the Old Testament. And so he's reading that um, and describing who they are in terms of uh, these stories of the people of Israel from ages, ages past. And that leads him into a discussion of idolatry, of, kind of worship of that which is not God, which is one of the things that if you're going to be people of God, Paul says, is just, is just right out. Um, it's just, uh, just kind of not an option for you. And he actually compares idolatry, or more, I suppose, contrasts idolatry to the Lord's Supper, to communion, to eating um, bread and, and the cup as the body and blood of Jesus. And all of this discussion of idolatry gets him back to one of our favorite topics as we've been going through the first Corinthians, um, whether or not one should eat meat sacrificed to idols. Um, we talked about this last week quite a bit. Um, it seems a bit esoteric to us, um, a very practical issue for them. Um, Paul can't keep himself um, from talking more about it. We'll get another pass at idol meat today. Chapter 11 then begins with one of the most puzzling passages in the New Testament. I'm going to try to make some sense out of it today. You are going to have questions left over, and I'm happy to talk with you about them later. But it's this passage at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 11, given over to the very important topic of why women ought to cover their heads in church. What? If you haven't noticed this, if you haven't read this before, it's in there. Um, what on earth is this about? Um, we're going we're gonna to wrestle with that a bit, a bit, and we'll have some thoughts on that. 
Um, it was really my goal to have a woman to preach this passage with her head uncovered. Um, we, uh, just to make the point that much more clearly, but we'll, we'll talk about why it is that I would be open to that happening. Um, some of you are like looking to put hymnals on top. No, it's, it's okay. Um, it's totally fine. So, uh, and, then, and then finally, after that, Paul returns to the Lord's Supper, which is really kind of the unifying um, topic of these, two, of these two chapters. He talks about the Lord's Supper, and he brings together a number of the practical issues that he's been discussing. And he really gives us an opportunity to kind of see, ah, oh, that's what's going on in Corinth. We've talked about this a couple times. Reading the letters of Paul can be like overhearing one side of an argument about a story you've never heard. <laughs> Right? You have two people having the, a deep discussion, sometimes, frankly, an argument, and you really wish you knew what it was they were arguing about. In this case, what is practically going on in this church in Corinth that has Paul kind of bringing up it's like these seemingly unrelated topics one after another? In this passage, we had a couple of insights before. In this passage, I think we get another opportunity to kind of see, ah, how a bunch of these different topics hang together. Why it is that Paul keeps talking about two groups of people, the strong and the weak, or the wise and the foolish. Why meat sacrifice to idols is such a pivotal topic to, for him. Why knowledge is so important but also deeply problematic. Why discernment is so key. And ultimately, that's where Paul lands, at this potentially cryptic phrase as he describes, can I grab the uh, remote? Oh, yeah. Um, as he describes, uh, he, he calls what it says, uh, it encourages them to do what he calls discerning the body. Discerning the body. And it was, this discernment has been a really core kind of image for Paul and core concern of his. And so as we take our next step forward in understanding what it is to be church together, we'll look at this. What is it, what is it that he means by discerning the body also, as we go through the rest of what um, God has for us here. So, as we, as we do that, um, I would like to, to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump right in. Holy Spirit, um, I, I just thank you that you are at work in, in, in your word, in the Bible. That when we read your scripture, we actually have an opportunity to encounter you. I pray that today, as we spend some time puzzling over, chewing on some of um, the, through, uh, in these couple chapters of your word, that you would bring things home to us. And if the Bible's been kind of foreign to us or a place where we haven't encountered you before, I pray that we would encounter you here um, today, this afternoon. As we hear these ancient words, they would become real to us in our moment right here, right now. So come, Holy Spirit, have your way. Amen. All right, so in, in chapter, uh, chapter 10, as I said, Paul begins by offering some really intriguing interpretations of some passages from the Hebrew Bible, from Paul's and his church's Bible. He's not uh, quoting specific passages precisely, but he's kind of retelling the story of the people of God in some surprising ways. And the way that he interprets is almost as important as what he ends up kind of getting out of it, what he has to say ultimately. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness." If you're not familiar with the story, this is Paul's take on the Exodus. Uh, the people of Israel enslaved in Egypt, and God leads them out through the sea. They wander around in the wilderness, um, led by a cloud, and in fact, um, ha God provides, miraculously provides food for them, and indeed provides water for them from a rock. That's the background you need to know, all right? And this is Paul's take as he kind of retells this story, and we'll see what he gets out of it in a minute, but his interpretation strategy here is quite interesting. Some of you will know, I, um, I teach Bible interpretation um, at the university, and, and let me just tell you, if Paul turned in this particular, these few verses as part of a, like, a Bible interpretation paper in a typical Bible interpretation class that we teach, um, he would fail. Um, this would receive a failing grade. Um, now, that may have more to say about the way that we teach Bible than it does to say about Paul. We'll get there in a second. Um, but why? Why would he fail? 
I would, I would pick on one of my f former students, but I, I, I will still just tell you, anachronism, what does that mean? He's got things, he's reading out of historical context, right? Anachronism is kind of the boogeyman of biblical criticism in, in our modern world, right? You gotta read in historical context. And again and again, Paul is caught interpreting the biblical history of ancient Israel in terms that only make sense in Paul's context, not in, the, not in the, what was even for him, ancient context many, many centuries before. First of all, writing to a bunch of Gentiles, non-Jews, Paul calls the Jewish people our fathers. And that's how Paul thinks of his communities. He thinks of them as the people of Israel. But that's already a bit of a stretch. Um, certainly not how any of the authors of Exodus or Numbers, the, the passages that he's interpreting, would have thought of these folks. Eh, fair enough. He's just trying to make it relevant, right? And then he describes the Exodus as a baptism. Now, Jews in the ancient world knew, knew about baptism, for sure. But they didn't talk about being baptized into Moses. The people who talk about being baptized into someone, well, the first one was Paul. Um, he talks about being baptized into Christ. No ancient Jew would ever have talked about being baptized into a person. It's certainly not Moses, right? Not the way that you're supposed to be. You get baptized into the people of Israel. Anachronism. I, if you can pick, I picture the red pen on the paper. Mm. But then you get to the whopper, right? To the worst of all, the point at which his TA starts pulling his hair out, right? He says, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, this particular story is straight out of Numbers chapter 20. You can look at it later, and if you do, I defy you to find in there any sign that this rock is anything other than a rock, okay? <laughs> In fact, much of the Bible is given over to trying to convince you that, that the God of the universe has nothing to do with inanimate objects like rocks. Um, but here is Paul saying, this particular rock in Numbers 20, he says, it is Christ. Full stop. Anybody who wrote Numbers 20 would have no idea, right? I, I think would feel misunderstood to, to see their text read this way. So Paul fails, right? Death by anachronism. Um, and actually, there's, there's at least one more, at least as striking as this, like, the rock was Christ bit later in, in the chapter. But Paul defends himself as though he knows that he's going to be kind of questioned about his reading strategy. He says, now these things took place as examples for us. These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, for us on whom the end of the ages has come. He's, Paul says, we, look, we live at a unique moment in history. We are those upon whom the end of the ages have come. And in the overlap of this age and the age to come, we live in a space that requires, as we have said before, a particular sort of imagination. And this imagination, Paul argues here, extends to the very way that we read and interpret the Bible. As I, I, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that history isn't important or that we shouldn't try to read in historical context. I've spent years learning precisely how to do that um, and chastising students for doing it um, poorly. Uh, what I am saying, however, is this. Routinely, when I have read carefully and in historical context, what I have found is ancient authors who have encountered God vividly in their own scriptures and who would be heartbroken if we ever felt that the Bible was somehow theirs and not ours. Paul is at great pains to insist, no, 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 this is your story. These things have happened even God has somehow been providentially arranging history. These things even happened as examples for you to learn from, and they were written down for your instruction with you in mind. So don't let anyone, not some high-flying Bible scholar, not any famous preacher, don't let anyone take this text away from you. It's yours. When you read about God's people, you're reading about yourself. And especially at this time, in this overlap of the ages, when time has folded over on itself, and in Christ you have access to the eternal now, own this book. Make it your own. Know it as your own. Read it together 
seeking the mind of Christ, and be courageous in finding your own story in its story. And be ready to be surprised by the way that God's word pops out of its ancient context and into your own. Be ready for it to do that almost too easily and without being constrained by the imaginations and intentions of its original authors. This is a posture that Paul adopts here and throughout his letters. It typifies all Christian interpretation of scripture for at least the first five or six hundred years. And this posture in reading the Bible is run, one from which I think we could stand to learn a, learn, learn a lot. All right, I'll get off that soapbox. But Paul has, in doing this interpretation, Paul has gleaned a rather simple but at the same time profound lesson. First of all, being the people of God means being united. United through shared experiences, through shared material participation in food and drink, which he will return to later. But it also has to do with being God's people and not anyone else's people. So the, the takeaway he has at the end, he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry, from worship of that which is not God. Don't even flirt with putting what is not God in God's place. Now, we might imagine this as one of those historically distant commands in Scripture that has very little to do with us. We don't have temples set up to idols, or so we think. My hunch actually is, and if you know me, you know that I think this, I actually think our world is full of idolatry. Idolatry of nation, idolatry of material wealth, or even in particular technology. The state and the market, those two at least, have their own cults, their own liturgies, their own temples where we go to worship. And they constitute very real spiritual forces that compete actively with God for our allegiance. And, and Paul makes his case this way. With what and with whom do you want to participate? By whom and by what do you want to be formed? And his comparison, as I, as I said, is to the Lord's Supper. He says, look, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel, this is his exegetical takeaway. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? So what do I imply then? The, that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Paul's point is this. Look, there's nothing magical or cursed about, about the meat itself, about the material that happens to have been uh, uh, slaughtered in, 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 a, in a temple. In the ancient world, all meat was slaughtered in a temple to, to some god or another. But the liturgy, the practices that surround that temple, that shape your mind, that shape your allegiances, those things matter deeply. Those things really matter a lot. So when it comes to our own idolatries, what am I saying? Do I mean that an iPhone or that the statue of Lincoln are in themselves kind of magical objects or deities in themselves? Of course not. But I do mean this. When we serve the things that these objects represent, when we wholeheartedly participate in their liturgies and their value systems, when we allow ourselves to be formed by them, we are in serious, serious trouble. And we should consider carefully the ways that we interact with the material manifestations of these demonic spiritual forces, as Paul would describe them. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And indeed, he goes on with that slogan next. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things build up. And Paul rehearses what should by now be a familiar argument to us, if we've been following along, on why eating idle meat is no big deal, on the one hand, and you should eat whatever you're served when at somebody else's house outside the church. It's just hospitable. But while you still might want to, why, but he still makes an argument why you might want to refrain if it could cause someone to stumble. That is, if your eating could, might cause someone to stumble. 
Because eating meat sacrificed to idols, outside the temple at least, outside the context of its actual like devotional liturgical context, isn't morally significant in itself. There's nothing magical about the meat one way or another. In this sense, idol meat is an example of a very large and very important category for Paul. I mentioned last week, we used the ancient Greek word for it, adiaphora, things that don't really make a difference morally. They're amoral, we might say. This is a large set of things whose objective significance is fundamentally reconfigured through the epic-making work of Christ on the cross. When Christ comes and introduces a new age, there's all these things that suddenly change their meaning. As we've noted for several weeks now, this includes basic aspects of the ways that we understand the world, like ethnic identity, class, and gender, the three markers that Paul declared adiaphora in his baptism liturgy. When someone would get baptized, they would recite this. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, these things aren't morally significant anymore. They no longer structure what is lawful or unlawful. This is what sets Paul, it brings Paul, this, this law-observant Pharisaical Jew, to, to the end of himself. And he realizes, without these categories, how on earth does the law make any sense anymore? These categories are no longer status markers of ultimate importance, but Paul is careful to insist to his Corinthian audience that they do, these categories still do persist in this present age. You don't get baptized and come out no longer like with a sexed body or as a member of, of a cultural group or even lo located in a class structure. And so these things still structure a playing field on which we're called to live out our discipleship to Jesus. And so how we relate to these things that don't matter in themselves matters a whole lot depending on whether or not we relate to them in ways that set people free from the enslaving powers of the idols of our age or in ways that build one another up and in ways that advance the, the, the spread of the gospel. And Paul summarizes this approach to the world when he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just, if I, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved, that they may be rescued. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In many ways, this is a restatement of what we heard Paul talk about last week, that, that memorable phrase. He says, I've become all things to all people, which unlike in our, in our culture, that tends to mean like, that's like the impossible task in which you kind of lose yourself in trying to please everyone. No, Paul says, nope, that's exactly what I do, and I think you should do it too. This is something of a, a summary of the same principle. In many ways, like I said, he, he said this before, but this time around he summarizes this approach with a really striking phrase. He says, give no offense. We don't have to translate this exactly this way. You might also translate this as something like, be blameless before, so it's, you know, the, the, this group or that group or that group. And I want to talk about this, not just because, I mean, obviously this is important to talk about. This is Paul's summary of his kind of whole way of life, a way of life, he says, for what it's worth, that he's learned from Christ. So that's probably important and worth thinking about. But we also need to be careful here because not offending people has become a rather kind of flimsy and silly posture that's still nevertheless advocated for in our, in our culture. And I don't think by offense here, Paul means exactly what we would mean. Um, and more to the point, I don't think that God's word to us today is to do our best not to offend anyone. It's certainly not what I've learned as I've tried to imitate Christ, as I've tried to follow Jesus. Rather, what I've learned is this. If, in fact, you do live your life as a testimony to Jesus, and the people around you don't trip up, don't stumble on anything, if they're not in the least bit offended, you're doing it wrong, right? Jesus' way of life is just so different than what we take to be normal that if we're really imitating him, we're going to ruffle some feathers. So it's not about not offending people in this thin sense that we often talk about in our culture. If you live your life as a testimony to Jesus, people will stumble on Jesus. They will stumble on Christ. The difficulty 
is making sure that they only stumble on Christ, right? Not on the cultural trappings that you decide to attach to Christ. Not on the religious rules that you decide to attribute to Christ. But I will say, in this tension, I find that our problem, my problem by and large, is not that I try to cause, that I end up causing people to stumble over things that aren't Jesus. Our problem, my problem, is that in trying to make everyone happy, I actually prevent people from stumbling even over Jesus. And I wouldn't want us to take this verse to authorize our, by which I mean my, cowardice. Rather, I, I think we instead have to do the difficult work of discernment that's required to live in obedience to Jesus wherever he leads. And, and in that process, let's make sure that our testimony to the one that we follow does not seek our own advantage, as Paul talks about, but rather seeks the benefit of those that we serve, that they might experience the rescue of Jesus in their lives, even as many of us have experienced the rescue of Jesus in our lives. And that will probably involve, as it did for, I think, any of us who've experienced that kind of rescue, it'll involve kind of a stumble here and there, right? getting tripped up on what Paul earlier in the, in the letter called the logic of the cross. Right? This whole way that God operates in the world that's just totally confusing and seems foolish to us. At any rate, I take it that the general principle is clear. Look, the world is full of adiaphora, we just don't have an English word for this, of, of things that make no difference in a certain sense. You are undeniably free on any number of issues to take up or to lay down cultural categories that others imbue with ultimate significance. That's Christian freedom. But whatever you do, be sure not to put any stumbling block before people except for Christ and him crucified. If we understand that that's the general principle, then I take it that actually the next quite confusing section of this letter, the part about women wearing head coverings, I actually think it becomes a little bit clearer. In a certain sense, then this whole business about head coverings is simply an application of the general principle. This is the section that begins, um, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Clearly. <laughs> and the passage, the passage goes on. But as I said, in, in context, I actually think we, could, we can make some sense of this. You imagine Paul saying this, and I think this is what, if, we, if we had more time, we could go through the whole thing, but we'll, we'll drop the needle here in there so you can see that this is what Paul's saying. Paul says, look, we know that in Christ there is no longer male and female. Something actually that he affirms later in verse 11. And we'll look at that in a second. Um, so then Paul would say, so let's see how we can be strategic to gospel ends here. How we can walk out our obedience to Jesus given this freedom and our responsibility to these people. How we can hold those two things in tension. First of all, Despite what some may say, Paul, Paul, Paul would, say, would say to the Corinthians, let's have women actively involved in the ministry of the church. After all, this sometimes gets lost in conversations of this passage, but the whole, this whole passage assumes that women are praying and prophesying in church. They're verbally, vocally participating in the life of the church. And not everyone at the time would have, would have agreed with this. Um, we know this in part because the text of 1 Corinthians itself in chapter 14 contains a later addition by someone who wanted all women to stay silent in church. Um, not a stance that Paul takes here. I can explain to you later why, uh, how it is that we can know that, that's, that, that those few verses in chapter 14 are a later addition. But Paul says, while that, is, while, while, while that, having women actively participating in church is worth having people who would disagree with it stumble over, because in, in stumbling over that, they're actually stumbling over Christ's work and making all of us one, Cultural convention about head coverings, Paul says, at this moment seems not to be worth taking any heat on for Paul and his Corinthian community. The expectation would have been, at least in some cultural groups that were present in cosmopolitan Corinth, the assumption would have been that it was simply a matter of modesty for women to cover their heads. 
is essentially the, the argument that Paul supplies from nature, as it were, um, later in, in a few verses. So look, Paul says, we can, uh, we can allow our freedom to be limited by the conscience of others. Principle that Paul's already established vis-a-vis -vis meat sacrificed idols. Sure, you have freedom to do that, but you're going to limit your freedom for the sake of not causing this person to stumble. Let's go ahead and observe the cultural norm for the sake of the gospel. Make sense? We'll do this. Nobody who's kind of wondering whether they should follow Jesus will walk into our, in our, into our meetings and see yes. something immodest happen. Okay. Even though we have total Christian freedom, right? Okay, all right. This works so far as it goes, I think, but you, some of you careful readers will, are probably unsatisfied. Because Paul seems to be saying more, right? He seems to be arguing for more. He's actually making the case that this practice of wearing head coverings is the consequence of fundamental structures in the creation itself. We, saw, we see some of this right already here in this passage. This headship language that Paul deploys, a kind of cosmic hierarchy of being. But we see it even more stridently later in verses 8 and 9. He starts arguing from Genesis, more Bible interpretation from Paul. For man was not made from woman, but woman was made from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman was created for man. Boy, <laughs> that's rough, right? You can start to think, like, Paul, do you, do you, you did say that, that bit in Galatians 3.28. Like, you remember that, right? <laughs> you remember your kind of like fundamental working principles, or have you forgotten them entirely? It's confusing. Even more confusing is that right after citing the creation story in a way that seems to affirm male headship in this huge hierarchy of being and, su and superiority, he then goes on to argue, of course, this is Paul. He argues exactly the opposite. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. What? These are basically the competing interpretations of the creation story offered by conservatives and progressives on gender questions in the church today. Right? You get them together and you kind of ask them, what does, what does uh, the beginning of Genesis tell us about gender? The conservatives will argue the top and the, and the progressives will argue the bottom. And Paul, here we have both of them in the same letter one verse separating the two of them. You can look at it, it doesn't, it doesn't explain, it doesn't solve the problem. In the same chapter of Paul, right? What gives? Well, I wonder if this in the Lord business is, it gives us a clue. In the second case, he says, nevertheless, in the Lord, yada, yada, yada. As in Galatians 3.28, I think in the Lord, or in Christ, is a technical term for Paul. It's a technical term for him that helps him distinguish the overlapping ages. Everything Paul has said about hierarchy, therefore, might be true in the world as we know it, as we have known it. But that world, of course, we've seen, Paul's already said several times in, in 1 Corinthians, that world is passing away. In the new world, in the new creation, as Paul calls it elsewhere, in this new creation coming to be in Christ, this is no longer the case. There is, after all, no male and female. So how could there be hierarchy between that which has no distinction? So in Christ, Paul says, we can know that gender hierarchy, if it ever truly existed, has been abolished. Because we're no longer oriented to a past in which we seek the essence of things by understanding their origins. Rather, we're oriented toward a future that has come upon us, as Paul says, and, and, and a future that is drawing us forward. It's not about a kind of return to the original, but rather a maturation of God's original good creation. That's Christian doctrine. If we have any sense that the whole thing is just a big circle, that's, that's a cyclical view of time. That's not a, that's not an, that's not a Christian um, kind of consummation eschatological view of time, right? I think the church has gotten confused about this. We start in a garden, but we end in a city, right? There's, it's, not just a, it's not just a big circle. Irenaeus in the second century was already on this. He says, he says the creation was good, like a baby is good. And if, and if that baby could somehow grow up and remain perfect, it would then be a perfect adult. 
perfectly good the whole way through, still a process of maturation. You wouldn't want to run that backwards, right? There's an arrow of, of process to it. And Aaron says, this is the story of, of the world and God's, and God's relating to it. And so we're free to encounter Jesus in our culture and navigate that culture with all freedom in order to maximize these higher order principles. Because what, is, what has been true of the world, even the world as God created it good, uh, no longer kind of uh, obtain uh, exclusively on us. We have freedom to pursue these higher order purposes. So we have, um, uh, oh, right, right. So, yeah, we've seen this. Eventually we get this argument from nature. All right, you can ask me about that later. Um, so we get to pursue these, these higher order goods that, that, that Paul's worried about. Our freedom from idolatry of the spirits of this age or any other. Our ability to love one another and build one another up. And our ability to communicate the good news of Jesus to our culture. These are the things we can pursue with Christian freedom and interact, as the Jesuits would say, with indifference, with detachment from the kind of cultural constraints in which we operate. And that means that we may come to a different conclusion in our context than did Paul in the Corinthian context. And I would say, I hope this isn't hard to persuade you, I would submit to you that we live in a moment where we ought to learn, where we ought to lean into the truth of our interdependence as gendered beings for the sake of all three of these higher order principles. Seeing us, uh, setting us free from various competing cultural idols of ideal manhood or ideal womanhood. Yeah, that's a good reason to like live in, live into that, uh, this kind of kingdom understanding of gender. Also, it allows us to build one another up in whatever it is that God has called us to, right? The church has struggled over this. God's called me to this ministry, but I'm a woman, can I pursue it? God's called me to this ministry, but I'm a man, can I pursue it? Yes, right? We can build one another up in whatever it is that God has called us to, regardless of whether that fulfills or subverts one or another cultural account of appropriate gender roles. And of course, in terms of communicating the good news of Jesus to a culture for whom reactionary accounts of biblical manhood and womanhood constitute a stumbling block to the gospel, right? We would be um, well served and and the gospel would be well served um, by going a different direction. And frankly, that would also serve a lazy postmodern, a, a culture that, that's, that's being given all these kind of lazy postmodern accounts that basically boil down to something like, only you know your true inner self. Um, these sorts of kind of do-it-yourself, like identity construction, I think, are ultimately lonely, isolating, and ultimately can be paralyzing. Now, if all of this sounds a bit too much like a word spoken from God directly to us in our time, in our moment, perhaps even moving beyond the imagination and intentions of Paul, the ancient author, then, well, I would simply suggest to you that that same ancient author was desperate for us to be prepared for precisely such words from God spoken to us through the scriptures. Actually demonstrated for that, that for us and gave us his rationale for doing so. As I said, I would love to have further conversation about that if, 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 if that is still, and there, of course, are puzzling things about that passage we still haven't, haven't worked out. But I want to press on um, to where I think Paul's really heading in all of these things, right? We've talked a little bit about the Lord's Supper, and Paul's coming back to the Lord's Supper, and he begins his comments this way. He says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Whatever it is you're doing, it's not the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Can't you party on your own, like in your own space, on your own time? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No. No, no, I will not. Now, it's important that we have the right thing in mind when we imagine the Lord's Supper that Paul is describing here. If we've kind of accustomed ourselves to like a tiny piece of bread and dipping it in a cup like we, like we do here, um, this whole thing, this po- opportunity, this possibility that someone would get drunk or that some, right, this, this issue of like who's going hungry it could just seem totally confusing to us. I take it that in the, in the contemporary world, we've split what in Paul's world was one thing called the Lord's Supper. We've split, we have split it into two different practices that we call um, church potluck and communion. 
Um, we've split these two things. In the ancient church, um, these, these were one and the same thing. They were simply called the Lord's Supper. But the problem is that these folks in Corinth don't have the potluck part right yet. They haven't quite worked out how the potluck part is supposed to work. The poor are going hungry while the rich eat their fill. The rich aren't sharing their food. Rather, Paul says, each one goes ahead with his own meal. I think the emphasis there should be on own. Not walking in like the pot, church potluck like where you put everything on the common place and then everybody takes the food. People are walking in with their own little private picnics, setting up their own little place and enjoying their meal while other people enjoy or don't enjoy their meal that they maybe couldn't even afford to bring. And look at how all the practical issues that we've been seeing in 1 Corinthians start to come together here all at once in the Lord's Supper. This is why Paul can't stop talking about it. The rich are bringing their dinners, their steak dinners, probably literally, right, steak dinners. They're bringing fancy food, meat, a luxury that the poor couldn't afford. The rich are bringing meat in, and they're not sharing it with the poor. And so the poor begin to complain. Paul, these, re these rich folks, they come to church and they bring food that, and they're not even sharing it with us. And more than that, Paul, this will get you on our side. Do you know what they're bringing? They're bringing idol meat. They're bringing meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And the rich then defend themselves with arguments we've already seen in 1 Corinthians. They say, oh, come on. Uh, and I, that, this food hasn't been sacrificed to idols. There's no such thing as an idol. Come on, Paul. You have to be on our side. And Paul is just about to tear his hair out, right? Because look, the rich are right. Fine, they, they have some knowledge, right? Knowledge that's not really helping them at all um, in terms of relating lovingly with their brothers and sisters in the church. But fine, Paul's fine. Of course, there's no such thing as an idol. You're right. But as we talked about last, last time, being right doesn't get you very far. And so Paul says, as we've heard him say for the past several weeks, look, if you think that this is about what food makes you more or less holy, like maybe he's getting from some of the poor in the, in the church, you're completely off the mark. Sorry, it's just not true. There's nothing magic about the meat one way or the other. But all of that is a red herring. Because the real issue is how are you treating one another? What matters is how your decisions about these things that don't matter impact your relationships, whether they build up or tear down those around you, whether what you do invites the people around you to follow Jesus or if it causes them to stumble over something other than Jesus. What's more important, Paul says, is the world is full of these sorts of issues, especially now that the kingdom is upon us, especially that we live now in this moment. Now that we know ourselves as those upon whom the ends of the ages have come, we now see that some of the very fundamental pillars of the creation are being, are being undone. And so the old rules don't apply, and that can be disconcerting. So what Paul is trying to do is reorient his, his community around what has always been this, what's always actually been central and what is now revealed as the very essence of life with God, moving into the future that's invading our present. Obedience, with, obedience to God through love of neighbor. Period. Paul, Paul, Paul says in Galatians, the entire law can be summed up in one word. Every other, every other rabbi of the time, including Jesus, said the law can be summed up in two commands. Love God and love your neighbor. Paul says the whole law can be summed up in one command. Love your neighbor. Because Paul's world was full of people who, for the sake of what they thought was loving God, were, were using that as an excuse not to love their neighbor well. He said, if you live blameless before people, you'll live blameless before God. If you live blameless before the Jews and the Greeks and the Church of God, that's your path to holiness. And so this new freedom available on the border between old creation and new, between this age and the age to come, this freedom is to be used to allow us to imitate Christ in his incarnational love for the world to become all things to all people, as Paul says, to be sure that the people around us stumble on nothing but Christ so that they may experience the rescue of God. And if when we share the Lord's Supper, 
And in sharing in the one bread, we become one body, and yet we do not love one another sacrificially in imitation of Christ's sacrificial love of us. If we do this, then we have failed to discern the body. Or to make things more clear, we might make that discern the body, the body of Christ. Discern the whole body of Christ, the church, the community formed by imitation of Christ's sacrificial incarnational life, death, and resurrection. If we haven't discerned the body, if we haven't understood the community and our role in it, if we haven't seen the poor in our midst and laid down our lives on their behalf, if we have failed to remove stumbling blocks other than Christ that are placed between our brothers and sisters and the good news of Jesus, if we haven't committed ourselves to pursuing the freedom of all from the idols of our age, then the Lord's Supper is an empty ritual. Or worse than that, we eat and drink, Paul says, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves as hypocrites for for partaking of the Lord's table without really deeply participating in it, without imitating his life without being formed by his character. Friends, the the call today is to discern the body, to see the church as God sees it, to see the church that God has called us to be, to lay down our lives for one another, to live our lives for the sake of the world around us that they might experience Jesus. They may experience the rescue of God. As I said, I, I, there, I know there's a ton there. <laughs> and, and, I, and I want us, I, I, we're going to spend some time in response and um, thinking about this and, and kind of just taking some time to soak in and ask for the Lord to speak to us. As we do that, I have a, I have a few, a few recl- re- reflection questions for us today just to Kind of take us back to, to things that God might, be, God might be saying to us. First question to think about is, how might God be inviting you to find your story in the story of Scripture? Actually, this is part of discerning the body, right? You look in the Scripture and you find the people of God. And then when you read discerningly, you understand that these people are your people, right? And you learn to live into their story. Perhaps you've experienced the Bible as distant and foreign, If so, I would encourage you to take God up on his invitation to read the Bible as your book and to do so with a group of people who are trying to do the same thing. Um, Imaginative reading um, goes less well in isolation, sometimes substantially less well. (laughs) Uh, So let me encourage you to engage in that in community. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ, but only we, (laughs) Only, only together, only in community. Perhaps attending the First Corinthians uh, Bible study this week would be a, a good first step if that's, if that's where you're at. Second, um, is there idolatry in your life? I'm, I, I, here I'm thinking specifically of socially acceptable idolatry, of which I gather there is plenty in our world. Is there idolatry in your life from which you need to flee? I love that Paul uses that word. Don't abstain. Flee. <laughs> Find where it is and run in the other direction. <laughs> um, I think we tend to flirt with idolatry more than flee from idolatry. Um, again, thinking of idolatry of nation, of material goods, of technology, idolatry of self, we could make long, long lists. There's lots worth thinking about there. Third, are you causing your friends and neighbors to stumble on anything other than Christ? Are there things that you've attached to Christ that are preventing people in your life from experiencing the rescue of God? Hunch is, that's probably the minority case in this room. However, the second question, are you preventing your, na- your neighbors from actually stumbling on Christ? That's a question probably more of us um, could wrestle with. That's the question I need to wrestle with, right? Are you, working to, are you actually just so inclined to make people happy that you're actually actively preventing them from actually having that fruitful, God-ordained stumbling over the upside-down logic of the cross? Finally, um, what is your growth edge in learning to discern the body? And as I said, in some ways, everything that we're talking about here, I think, kind of falls under this, under this category of learning to discern the body, see who the people of God are, where they are, what they're doing, and how you can enter in. 
But perhaps, I just want to throw this um, possibility out there. Perhaps there's a particular relationship to which God wants to bring um, reconciliation. That could be a relationship here in this room or a relationship with someone in this community who happens not to be here right now. Jesus actually commands his followers to reconcile before they come and worship. And um, perhaps God is even inviting you um, now to confess a need and a desire to reconcile right now before, um, before receiving communion, what Paul calls um, our, our altar.